The Lord be with you. And also with you. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. That was kind of a beautiful moment, wasn't it? That still silence that came uh, as we gathered and continuing to gather in this place, uh, and then opening, breaking that fast and that silence with Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. It is so good, and it is so right, and it is so much fun to gather here um, and continue to gather in this sanctuary, this holy place of our Lord, as we prepare um, for Easter festival worship. As always, we gather here remembering that it is God who welcomes us into this space, and then we turn and welcome one another into worship, and we always welcome um, those who we do not know well yet. Perhaps you are gathered here um, worshiping with family or with friends. Um, Perhaps you are gathered here because the Spirit just nudged you to this place on this particular day. Um, Perhaps you are here because it's a big movable feast, and sometimes you worship elsewhere, but today you are here for whatever reason the Spirit of God has brought us to this place and this time. And there are no strangers here in the holy place of our Lord, only friends that we have not yet met. So we're grateful to have an extended and expanded community today. There are friendship registers on the inside aisle of each pew. They're a red kind of leather bound looking book. Reverend Katie Cashwell is going to hold one up. If you're closest to it, I invite you to um, take hold of it. Let us know that you're here. You can pass it to the outside and then let it come back to the center. This is one of the ways um, that we do turn strangers into friends and get to know one another by name and then by story uh, as we grow as a family of faith. Um, I do want to draw your attention to the flowers in the sanctuary this morning. Um, we, they are all native plants that are native to North Carolina that are growing and blooming. This was actually part of a f- five congregation project um, led by Beth Harris. She worked with several uh, native plant growing nurseries and four other congregations. Um, she is one of our best evangelists in a lots of different ways. So it's not just West Raleigh, um, but four other congregations who are enjoying native plants in their sanctuary this morning because of the good work of this congregation. So just something exciting to celebrate uh, as we gather today. Um, One great hour of sharing. There are um, envelopes in the pew pockets in front of you. We will come to this again in a minute. But this is um, one day where West Raleigh joins with the wider Presbyterian Church um, on a special offering that is called One Great Hour of Sharing. The offerings that are um, given and received in these envelopes support efforts to relieve hunger, promote development, and assist in areas of disaster. Um, Friends, there is all kinds of disaster um, and Good Friday news around the world, and this is one way that we take hold of the good news and extend it out into the world um, in God's promise of justice and goodness and love. So I invite you to join in that offering if you feel so moved. Next week, uh, members and friends of West Raleigh, we will regather for worship at 11, and that will be followed by a congregational meeting. We'll be, we have two orders of business next week at that meeting after worship. One is the election of new officers, and the other is there are portions of West Raleigh's administrative manual that the congregation is called to approve. Um, so we will be doing both of those bits of business. Don't worry. It is not overwhelming. It will all be fine. Alec Peters will lead us in that conversation. Um, so we'll meet here after worship next week. And then I just put a quick plug in for two retreats. The Presbyterian women are hosting their spring retreat next Saturday. And then West Raleigh has an all-church retreat scheduled at the end of April. If you're interested in signing up for either of those, um, you can see one of the pastors or the website or the e-newsletter following worship. Any other announcements that need to be spoken? I don't think so. Terry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next Sunday morning in our um, Hassis um, Sunday school class at 945, um, it's, it's Dr. Hildebrand. What is his first 
Dr. Reginald Hildebrand will be um, leading us in a conversation about Freedom Park, which is um, one of Raleigh's newest parks. It's actually a state memorial um, celebrating uh, all of the different ways that people of color have been involved um, in North Carolina's continued push for, for full freedom and liberation. Um, the park was 20 years in the making, and Dr. Hildebrand has been a part of its envisioning and its development all along the way. So really exciting to have him at West Raleigh um, to tell the story of this memorial, and then we'll be following it up later um, with a trip uh, to the memorial as well. Thank you. That's next week at 945. Friends, let us turn our hearts and our minds to the worship of Almighty God.
Friends, please stand in body or in spirit and join me in our call to worship. Look. A sliver of light across the horizon. The miracle of a new day. See. The sun is rolled away. The angel calls from within. Feel. The freedom of our spirits and the wonder of resurrected life. Hear the alleluia's ring as we declare to the world, Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. is that our world, our city, even our own lives are full of situations about which we close our eyes and plug our ears. The good news of a God who loves us is that we can acknowledge that before God and God promises to help us open our eyes and unplug our ears to acknowledge and respond to the reality of our world. Will you join me in prayer? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, from your burning cry to your last breath, you bore witness to the promises of God not to destroy the world, but to restore it to the ways of justice and righteousness. In this Good Friday world, our vision is easily clouded, We cannot see what is possible through the pain. We cannot hold hope 
because we feel helpless. On this day of resurrection, clear our ears, open our ears to the good news that rises with Jesus. The promise remains, the hope lives, the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. My friends, listen, see. The water that rinses our eyes clean, the water that flushes our ears so that we can hear, the grace and power and forgiveness of our risen Lord. Alleluia and amen. you may be seated, but are there young theologians, those who have been hunting for Easter eggs and now are hunting for some good conversation about God? The Lord be with you. Good morning. Good morning again. Good morning. The Lord be with you. Hey, Severn. Oh, look at you. Good morning. It's so good to see y'all. Hey, guys, come on up. Is there, there is room for everybody, even if we have to scooch a little bit. Hey, Robin. All right, Olivia Joy. Yes, you get to come join the young theologians, too. Yeah. So, did anybody find any Easter eggs this morning? Yes. Did any... You found a lot. Yeah, yeah. Did you help anybody find some? That was really kind of you. That was kind. And I know Sydney was really hunting for someone to help, and everybody had an abundance of eggs. There really was enough. There was enough. So I think that we should say a quick thank you to everyone who baked and made coffee and maybe hunted eggs and maybe... Um, the Easter Bunny this morning, because it was a really special way to start the day, wasn't it? I took a picture with the Did you take a picture with the bunny? Yeah. Awesome. So on my count of three, let's say thank you. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you, young ch- your children and uh, families, folks. So this morning, you were hunting Easter eggs. When we gather in the sanctuary, we do theology, which is hunting for understanding about God, searching for understanding about God and how God works in this world. Yeah. That's a good question. That's such a good question. Um, Anybody have an idea why there are plants here? That's right, right. Easter falls in the springtime where 
all kinds of um, plants are coming back to life after sleeping during the winter. Bless you. Phoebe, did you have a possible answer? What was your yeah? Um, plants grow to death. That's right. During the winter, the plants go to sleep, right? And then in the spring, we could they're awake again. That's right. They're awake again. Oh, I love that. I love that. And um, in the story of Jesus, um, during Holy Week, when um, he left the disciples after their last supper together, he went to the garden to pray. And then when on the day of Easter, when he went from death to life and was resurrected again, that church word we use to talk about when, some, when Jesus went from death into new life, Mary actually thought he was a gardener. That resurrection happened in the middle of a garden. So these plants help us remember new, the new and risen life of Jesus. Sydney, were you going to say something that I'm going to ask? Him? No, okay. So there actually was an answer to that question right? But have you ever asked a question that there was no answer to? What's that? Plenty of them. Plenty of questions that didn't have answers. We love questions. Yes. Can you think of a question that you might have asked that didn't have an answer, that nobody, teacher, parent, aunt, uncle, yep, could, they couldn't answer? How what? How do you make a car? A car. <laughs> right? I mean, that's a really good question. That's a really, and I bet, I bet no one person can answer that whole question. There are too many parts, people, places that go into making a car for one person to tell you exactly how a car is made. What else? Can you think of another question that nobody's been able to answer? Right, like how did people figure out how to use coal, most of which was buried deep, deep in the ground, to find it, to use it to make electricity? Can you imagine like the number of people over all these generations that had to keep working on that question before they could figure out how to use it? Yeah, that's such a good question. And again, no one person no one historian, no one scientist could have the whole answer to that question. Does anybody else have one you want to share? Yeah. How do you make the phone? How do you make the phone? Yeah. Do you notice something about all of these questions? What was the first word in each of these questions? How. <laughs> how questions. There are a lot of how questions that don't have answers. And I can think of one that we are sort of here gathered to celebrate today that I can't answer. How did Jesus rise? That's right. How did Jesus rise? How did someone who was really real and alive, right? We celebrated his birthday at Christmas. And we've read all of these stories about Jesus and his disciples and all of the things that he did, some of which we don't understand how he did them. He really died on Friday, and then he really rose again on Sunday. Yes. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's another one of those questions, not unlike the questions that y'all were just asking. It's a question that is too big for any one person or any one church to answer. We just can't answer that question. But I have another question for you that I think might help us along the way. Let me ask this one and then, or, how do you know that someone loves you? How do you know someone loves you? You don't know. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Not physically? Mentally, Campbell? Yeah, like when they care for you when they're sick. Yeah, even if they don't say it, you know 
that making you something special when you're sick, like that means I love you. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, that Jesus may have actually been, we've been trying to understand and answer these questions for such a long time. Yeah. Does it? Yeah. This church looks a lot like your church at preschool. Yeah. Anybody else, how do you know that some that maybe your parent, maybe your grandparent loves you? How do you know? Yeah. I can see all kinds of ways of knowing. Maybe because they know which stuffed animals are your favorite and they make sure you have them with you when you come to church. Yeah, maybe because they're sitting next to you, your aunt is sitting next to you, reminding you that she loves you. Yeah, yeah. Maybe your mama is holding you as you look at the flowers and you know from her strong arms that you are loved. We don't know exactly how the resurrection happened. We're going to keep asking all kinds of questions about how it happened all the days of our lives. But somehow, we can know that through that resurrection, God loves us so very, very much and wants all kinds of good things for us, just like our parents who take care of us, our grandparents who remind us how loved we are, the church that mirrors and echoes that love, like spring flowers coming out of the ground at wintertime. All of that helps us to know being named after our grandparents, Olivia Joy. Yeah, that we are loved and loved by people in our lives and loved by God. So let's all gather, stand up. And as a way to remember that that love is super, super real, stand up carefully. Yep. (laughs) Um, This is baptismal water that reminds us of God's love. It helps plants grow, right? And it reminds us of God's love. And some of the, some of you gathered here were baptized in the water at this font in God's love. So we're going to say an open-eyed prayer. I'll, I'll start and then let you guys finish. Is that okay? Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. Whew, we thank you, <coughs> we thank you. for being who you are. For loving us, for helping us to love you, we are never going to have all the answers. And yet we thank you that we can feel so loved. Amen. Amen. All right. It's family worship day. That's what I thought. So what we're going to do is one by one, Severin and Robert, do you guys want us to come start? Let's just put your finger in the water and touch it to your forehead. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. And now we're going to let somebody else. Olivia Joy, your turn. Can you put your finger in? The Lord is risen. He loves you indeed. Here you go. Do you want to come next? Okay. Oh, let's see. Here we go. Emma Kate and Campbell, why don't y'all go? The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Come on. Whoop. Yeah. The Lord is risen. There you go. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. And you are so loved. Bless you. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen. And he loves you so much. Come on over, Colbert. Yeah. The Lord is risen. He's risen indeed. (gasps) Hey, sweet thing. Luna, would you like to touch the water? The Lord is risen, and he loves you so much. He is risen indeed.
Friends, please join me in prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, Fill us, use us, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen. Our prophet lesson from today is Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. Listen for the word of God for you today. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations, He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from John 20. A story that happens in the garden. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And then Peter and the other disciples set out, and they went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and looked in, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples turned, and they went to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside that tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know yet that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried Jesus away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. 
But go to my brothers and my sisters, my siblings and my friends, and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Church, this is the word of the Lord, the good news of the gospel. Thanks be to God. It is Easter Sunday, and yet sometimes it still feels like Good Friday is on repeat. Wars and conflicts persist all over the world. We hear news daily from Gaza and the West Bank, from Haiti and Ukraine, but the scale of global violence is far more broad. The Geneva Academy classifies conflicts according to international and humanitarian law, and they are monitoring 110 armed conflicts around the world. 110. North Africa and the Middle East are the most affected regions with 45 armed conflicts, but there are another 35 in sub-Saharan Africa alone. Natural disasters have also taken their toll on our world. In 2023, there were four major national dis- natural disasters that took over a thousand lives. It was just a little over a year ago that an earthquake in Turkey took over 55,000 lives. Last week, during our theological reflection with the children, we learned about a species of turtles that almost was wiped out in Australia. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, it was almost wiped out. Local authors and members of this congregation, Anders and Beverly Gyllenhaal, have just finished a national book tour spotlighting the enormous decline in the bird population over the last generation. Is this decline the proverbial canary in the coal mine, they asked? Already knowing the answer. Recent data reports that a steep decline in school attendance that we attributed to the pandemic has persisted, and rates of depression and anxiety and adolescent mental health remain elevated. And researchers are trying to connect all of these dots, and they are seeing increasing evidence that this, as well as other indicators, may be symptomatic of a larger trend, that the fabric of our society, that which bound us together, has fragmented. The Good Friday world on repeat. Closer to home, our country, our state, our community is facing down an election cycle that bears witness to just how fragmented we have become. We haven't recovered from the last rounds of bruising attack ads or dehumanizing campaign slogans and mudslinging. And all of that that is happening in our world then makes it even harder for that personal loss and grief, the changes and the challenges that are part and parcel of being human. As one psychologist once told me, we are just living in a time where our sunscreen, our perfection, our our protection, our armor, it's gotten thin. Former pastor Sandy McGahee was well known in this congregation for saying, walk gently, for everyone is carrying their own cross And if you don't know what it is, you just don't know them well enough. We've lost a lot of saints in this congregation this last year, and many of you have lost your own saints. Life has changed in ways we didn't expect. Challenges have persisted in ways that have left us tired. New realities have emerged that we haven't yet fully comprehended. The support system that once held us together has frayed, leaving us deeply personally and communally fragmented. And all of this, on this grand global worldwide scale and in the most intimate details of our heart taken together, can leave us feeling like maybe this just is as good as it gets. Maybe this is all there is and is ever going to be. Maybe that grief will always drain us of joy, that This helpless feeling that we sometimes have will always leave us feeling hopeless. 
that Good Friday is just on repeat and that it's not going to get better. It can leave us waiting on that other shoe to drop or wondering what on God's earth will happen next. I wonder if Mary Magdalene had come to that conclusion herself when she approached that tomb. She had witnessed the worst of the worst, the betrayal of friends, religious complacence, deadly political maneuvering, the way crowds of people can be manipulated and weaponized and turned against themselves and their own best interest. She had seen and experienced it all. Good Friday had clamped down hard on the hope that Jesus had stirred within Mary and the disciples. If he was gone, then maybe the movement was gone. And if the movement was gone, then the momentum was lost. And if the momentum was lost, then maybe it was just all over. Mary approached the tomb where Jesus had been buried on Friday. And when she saw that the stone had been rolled away, she assumed the worst. I would, how could you not just assume the worst? So she ran to get Simon Peter and John, crying out that Good Friday pain. They have taken my Lord out of the tomb, and I do not know where they have laid him. And given the events of last week, she had no reason to believe otherwise. So together they ran back to the tomb, and they peered inside, and they saw fragments of the story, the linen cloth scattered around, one part of it carefully laid, folded where Jesus' head had been. John had an inkling, the story says, and he and Peter turned and they ran for home. But Mary stayed. Mary stayed and she wept. I don't know why Mary wept exactly, but I can imagine. Imagine she wept because she couldn't reverse time. She couldn't save Jesus. She wept with the pain of the world. She wept for loss of what she thought was going to be. She wept because her hopes and dreams were scattered in piles like that linen she saw in the tomb. Mary, still weeping with Good Friday, clamped down hard on her shoulders, heard voices asking her a question. Why are you weeping, they said. Because, she said, they have taken my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. And then she turns around and she sees someone else who she thinks might be the gardener. And he too asks her, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? So she asks him, are you the one that has taken away the body of my Lord? If so, just tell me where he is. She is still stuck in that Good Friday world. But church, here's the thing. She's not stuck there alone. It is Jesus standing right beside her before she is ever even able to know that it is him. He is there. He is here. Easter is rising into that very space where Mary has been weeping and she does not yet know it. Jesus meets her there and says her name, Mary. And then she gets it. Rabboni, she says, teacher. And it was in that moment that Mary learned something about herself and something about the world that God so loves. Mary realized that it had been her assumptions about the world that had fixed a ceiling on hope. Not God's power to keep creating and recreating all things new. The ceiling that had weighed so heavily on Mary's shoulders It was what you and I might call a glass ceiling. And it was no match for the resurrected Jesus, the one who rose right through it, breaking it and filling that broken and fragmented space with possibility and potential and hope. Church, this is not a Good Friday world on repeat. There is more to this story. So, What if we, too, are jumping to conclusions too soon? What if we are the ones making assumptions about the world that are no more than glass ceilings that have been put in place to hold back and keep down what is righteous and compassionate, what is just and true? 
What if the fragments, those pieces of linen that are scattered around our world, are actually signs of life, straining against death, ready to break free from the bloom of new life, just like Martha's illustration on the cover of your bulletin? What if the broken places hold within them clues, inklings, that there is more, that this is not all that there is, that out of that winter, out of that dormant season can come new life. There is more. So disciples in church, what would it look like if, like Mary, we dared that that pre-dawn darkness? What would happen if we turned our fear into curiosity? What would happen if we stayed long enough in our discomfort to let it become longing? What would happen if we identified that anxiety, figured out what it is about, and let it melt and mold us into hopeful, courageous people? And then once there, could we stay long enough, even if it means that we weep, to witness Jesus rise into that broken and fragmented and seemingly empty space and fill it with healing and with hope, with wonder and with beauty, with artistry and with joy. Mary witnessed that world. In the flash of an eye, at the sound of his voice, she knew it to be true, that wonder and hope were alive and well in the risen Lord. Right there in front of her, amid the fragments of cloth that still laid scatter, but they could no longer contain him. Mary, Jesus said, Mary, do not hold on to me. Keep going, dear one. Go back to the disciples, my friends, and tell them Jesus is alive. He is ascending to the one from whom he came, the one from whom all life comes, the one from whom your life comes. So Mary pivots on her heels and she runs back to get the others And she preaches that very first Easter sermon when she says, I have seen the Lord, I have seen the Lord, and I believe. So, you know, in John's gospel, belief is not a theological exercise that just resides and happens up here. Belief is not answers to questions, especially not questions that start with how. Belief is not an explanation. It can't be quantified or qualified Belief is a particular experience of the risen Lord, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the Holy One who calls you by name. Belief is to feel the presence of the risen Lord, to have that experience of thinking there is no way out, this is all there is, until the dawn of a new day comes and the risen Lord calls your name. And you know that just like there is water in that font, you are loved and beloved, and there is more. To believe is to see glimpses of God in the world. To believe is to hear the whisper of that still, small voice that calls to you. I have risen into the space in your life and in your world that needs healing. I will keep rising from the ashes, and I will take you with me. There is hope in the silence. There is possibility and potential in the broken pieces. So West Raleigh Presbyterian Church is preparing for a centennial anniversary. In 2027, this congregation will celebrate her 100th birthday. West Raleigh Presbyterian Church was founded between the two world wars, just before the stock market crash sent the whole world into the Great Depression. It was at that time that West Raleigh chose to invest in this neighborhood, to put down roots and to build a church at a time when many said it would be foolish to do so. But West Raleigh stayed and wept with those who wept and welcomed those who were not welcomed elsewhere Believing that Christ would rise into this space and do something new. 
West Raleigh stayed, and when the civil rights movement revealed a country that remained deeply divided and broken, West Raleigh stayed and proclaimed the good news of the gospel that there is more. That God rises up into these spaces and creates new community that is built on dignity and love and justice. More recently, when the pandemic reminded us of just how precarious life is, West Raleigh stayed, believing that in that fragmented and broken space, Easter rises. Easter always rises into the space between war and peace, into the space between racism and full humanity, into the space that feels empty and broken. That, dear friends, that church of Jesus Christ, that is where Christ is most alive. So here we are, 2,000 plus years later, almost 100 years for this congregation, we are still here. You are still here because somewhere along the way, Christ rose into broken and fragmented space and shattered assumptions. My assumptions, your assumptions, even the church's assumptions about what is possible. And church, that is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is as real as water in the font. Easter always rises into those spaces that seem the most empty and depleted, turning our helplessness into hope, reminding us that when Easter rises, the living Lord will take us with him. Breathing new life into you, into those who you love, into those who need to know that they are loved, into the church of Jesus Christ. Easter always rises, and that is the good news of the gospel that we have inherited and that we will continue to share. Church, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Easter rises again.
friends, the Lord is risen. risen The table is set. The feast is abundant. God has given us good things, and it is from these good and right and just things that we return the gifts of God as the people of God. We return them in song, in praise, and in thanksgiving. And all God's people say, Alleluia and Amen. from east and west and north and south to come and gather at this table, this table at which we remember and celebrate and give thanks, this table that somehow holds the fullness of life, the reality of death, and the promise of life, this table which is not ours. It's God's table, and God invites all of us all of us to come exactly as we are. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise, O God, for the glory and the joy of creation. It is a good thing uh, that Easter only comes once, because there are many a details. So we bless you, O God, for today's coming. For blessed is your Son, Jesus, our host at this table. Blessed is your spirit who consoles and inspires, and within these gifts of bread and cup, transforming them, making them sacred, and filling our bodies and our spirits with your boundless love. And so with gratitude and praise, we come to your table, fragmented, yes, and yet fully alive, ready to be filled, ready to be sent out, ready to be your people in the world. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Hear us, your people, O holy God, as we pray the prayer that has formed and shaped disciples from each generation, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, on the night of his arrest, Jesus sat at table with friends, and he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. <laughs> In the same way, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is God's love poured out for the life of the world that is beloved. This is the cup of the new covenant that is sealed in the forgiveness of sins and given for you. Later on, as the church grew and developed, St. Paul added that each time we gather and eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the saving grace of the risen Lord until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, let us keep this glorious Easter feast. Friends, this feast has been prepared, and if this side is gluten-free, bread is available, and this side is gluten-full. In the back, there'll be two stations in the back and two in the front, but if you need gluten-free, I invite you to go to a station on this lectern and piano side of the church. The gifts of God for the people of God. Come.
sister Mary come a running at the break of day. Brought the news from heaven, stone is rolled away. Has everyone been served? Good. of the new covenant given for you. The cup of the new covenant given for you. of the new covenant cup of grace given for you Catherine this is the body of Christ and the cup of blessing Let us pray. Holy One, risen Lord, having fed our hunger and quenched our thirst, we ask that you would give us courage to go to the pre-dawn places, to stay in the pre-dawn places, to lean into the least comfortable places, to encounter all our emotion, to lean to linger, to learn, to weep with those who weep, to yearn with those who yearn, to show up where and when it matters the very most, knowing in our hearts 
and in our guts that Easter always rises. Give us courage this day and always. Amen. Sometimes the world does look and feel a little bit fragmented. Sometimes the world is messy and incomplete. Sometimes it feels like Good Friday is on repeat. But just like this family mealed, shared, broken, offered, given, and received, and now a little bit messy, this is right where Christ shows up and rises into this space and invites us to follow. So friends, go out into this world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor and serve all people, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit to rise again and again and again. Friends, go in peace to love and to serve the risen Lord. And all God's people say, Alleluia and Amen. Amen.